Televiziunea Română, întâlnirile JTI și Fundația Art Production vă recomandă garantat 100%. Seara. Bine v-am regăsit la Garantat 100%. Invitatul nostru are o poveste de viață foarte interesantă și a început cariera ca inginer chimist. A studiat apoi psihologie, după care a trecut la studiul inovației. E una dintre cele mai recunoscute și respectate autorități din lume în domeniul inovației. A scris cărți și articole devenite reper în acest domeniu, ține conferințe, cursuri, stagii de pregătire, lucru pe care îl face și pentru cei care doresc să se dezvolte în domeniul ăsta în România. E profesor emerit la Facultatea de Afaceri a Universității Exeter din Marea Britanie. Le mulțumim prietenilor de la Institutul de Marketing pentru mijlocirea acestui interviu. Doamne și domnilor, este o mare bucurie să-i spunem bun venit la garantat 100% profesorului John Bassent. Professor Bassent, good evening and thank you so much for accepting this invitation. Good evening, it's a great pleasure to have the chance to join you. It's very spectacular what we see in the background and uh, before beginning this recording, uh, I was asking you if Peter Gabriel or Jimmy Page could be around. <laughs> Uh, well, as I said, they're probably just around the corner having a cup of coffee. But, then we uh, have a wonderful uh, company. Uh, absolutely, yes, yeah. But this is this is my music studio where it all happens. It's fun. And it's so nice to see that place. It looks like a laboratory, like a creative laboratory. Mm -hmm. Professor Besant, can we please begin our conversation by clearly defining what do we understand by innovation? Because Some people might think that inventing something is the same thing with innovating. What's innovating? It's a great question, and this isn't the first time I've been asked it. Um, I think if we begin by thinking, uh, it's not like the cartoons. You know in the cartoons, <laughs> bing, the light bulb flashes. That's the start of something. That's important. That's an idea. But it's a much longer journey to create value from that idea. My very simple definition of innovation, it's creating value from ideas. And that can be commercial value, it can be running a business, that's really important. It's also social value, it's making the world a better place. We need innovation for that. But it's not just the idea, it's much more. And of course, history is full of great examples of people who had great ideas, but they weren't able to create the value with them. That is so right. But We also have an obsession, and we will talk a lot about obsessions. Uh, I will also take into account your psychologic training. We will talk about obsessions. There's an obsession in the Romanian public area. We always talk about values, and it's not only a Romanian obsession. We talk about values, and we're obsessed with the fact that values are disappearing from our lives. How will you define value? Value is what's important to us. Um, in a commercial sense, it would be what someone is prepared to pay for. But it's much more than that. Mm -hmm. It's what we care about. It's, uh, it's what shapes our behavior. We do things in line with our values, our core beliefs. So value is absolutely at the heart of what we need to think about. And in the world of innovation, that's where we need to start. Mm -hmm. Not just, I've got a great idea, but I have a value proposition a theory that you will value what I've come up with. Of course, I have to test that, and I may encounter quite a lot of resistance as I realize you don't value it unless I change it, I reshape it. Well, some of my compatriots, and I'm pretty sure that some of your compatriots as well, will say something like this. Um, value is a word, a term, which is fundamentally non-compatible with business. How will you answer to that? <laughs> well, as I said a little earlier, um, value is partly, in a commercial sense, what someone's prepared to pay for. So if you're a businessman and you have something which no one else values, you'll be out of business very fast. And of course, what we teach and what we train these days very much around innovation 
is working at the value starting point. What's the value proposition and how to bash that into shape so that other people will have something valuable. Uh, and that really explains quite a lot of those failures. Um, there's in fact a, a wonderful museum of failure. It's uh, in Sweden physically, but you can go online and find it. But it's full of exhibits. And I have to say, not just from small innovators, from some of the big global names that we all know and love. What do they show in that museum? Failures. Products, mainly product ideas, which somebody, some group of marketeers, some uh, brilliant scientists said, oh, the world will value this, and they didn't. Um, and sometimes it's a learning experience and they can build on that. Uh, let me give you a very simple example. Um, okay, but please don't tell me labels and brands. We're not allowed to do okay. that. But I you're familiar about with that. I to myself. No, no, I, I, I do understand. Uh, but a very famous baby food manufacturer, I won't name them, decided that in our modern world, adults are very pressed for time. They don't have time to eat properly. So they're dashing off to the office, but they need a good healthy breakfast. So their idea was to put a kind of puree of good vegetables and other things in a jar that adults could spoon out. In other words, baby food for adults. And they spent a long time developing and testing this. Uh, they discovered that surprisingly, nobody wanted baby food for adults. They didn't value it. That's a, an example, one of the many in the Museum of Failure and the many others that we know about. So if we're serious about innovation, as I say, it's more than the idea, and we have to be clear about this value proposition and test whether mm -hmm. that theory, that proposition, actually holds up. But in terms of ethics, um, is value compatible with business? And that, that's a very good question. Um, yes, I think it is compatible, and increasingly I think we're seeing uh, uh, organizations recognize that and think very much more about how they make their products sustainable, how they uh, recognize some of the other core values in our societies, and make sure their products or their innovation ideas fit with that. Um, we talk a lot about what's called responsible innovation. Right. At, at the heart of responsible innovation is innovation isn't always good, and it isn't always for the benefit of everyone. So before we start, Let's ask ourselves a few questions. Let's try and imagine the future and make sure that we've got the, uh, the end user's viewpoint included, that we've got something that we can shape that will deliver responsible innovation. So it's, it's becoming a very important theme. Um, and as I say, I think you can see this reflected in the, uh, uh, in the offerings mm -hmm. of many large organizations now. They, they are trying to uh, uh, be compatible with our wider social values. Um, and mm. they have to be careful because you can have um, a good examples of what I'd call greenwashing, for example. You, you color your products green. Oh, yes, we're sustainable. You haven't really changed them. People aren't stupid. They will recognize that. So if you're serious, you do have to really rethink this responsible approach to innovation. Professor Besant, um, I was just thinking now at the fact that Business is something very complicated. Marketing is something very complicated. Marketing is compatible with ethics. Marketing is compatible with values. And I'll try a more precise question. Um, can marketing, in its essence, make a product better than it really is? <laughs> What marketing can do, uh, basically, is to bring out the features. Um, the difference between sales, sales is just saying, I've got something and I'm going to get you to buy it. Right. So I'm doing it, I'm, I'm doing it to you. Marketing says, I want you to want this. And I'm going to tell you a story about it. I'm going to highlight its strong features. But in the end, it's you wanting the product. That's the, perhaps, for, the, for me, the key distinction. And I'll give you a good example. Um, uh, there's a very famous product. Um, it would be difficult to, not to name it, but basically um, uh, it's widely used around the world. It's a very nice, bright plastic food container. It comes in all shapes and sizes, and it has a very special lid. I think you probably know where I'm going. Oh, yes. Yeah, but that's fine. The man who invented that was a brilliant chemist. In fact, I'd say he was an alchemist. He had the ability to turn not lead and base things into gold, but the next best thing. 
he took oil sludge, the waste product from oil refineries, and somehow converted that to that bright, clear plastic that we know and love. And that was a brilliant invention, and he patented the seal and all the rest, came up with a wonderful product which people thought was great. It would sell itself. It didn't. And his problem was essentially not coming up with the product, not doing all the hard chemical mm -hmm. work, but essentially the marketing. And fortunately, very fortunately for him, uh, since it wasn't selling in stores, he tried a different approach and he met a woman uh, and this particular lady, a woman called Brownie Wise, uh, specialised in the very early days of the um, in-home party kind of marketing, what we now call social marketing. So she demonstrated the product to groups of housewives in their own home, uh, and they had a party. They had lots of gossip, little food and drink, and during that entertaining evening, she demonstrated the product. And her party piece was to fill it with a, a very nice tomato soup and seal the lid. And then hurl it across the room. And you could see everyone say, oh my God, that's going to go on the carpet or the wall. And of course it didn't because the seal was strong. That convinced all those women, hey, we'd like one of these. This looks like a good product. And basically what she did was to sell directly, market it directly by showing the features. But cleverly, she also said, well... There's only one of me, but maybe one or two of you would like to take this on and become the marketeers for this. And she built, a, if you like, a pyramid uh, through which the company grew to its global success. Uh, she became a vice president for marketing, but she pioneered what we would now call social marketing. Now, I'd suggest that little story, which is for me wonderful, uh, basically underlines the difference between having a great idea making a great product and trying to sell it and marketing, which is persuading people that they want it. So yes, marketing can. Um, we have to be a little careful sometimes because of course you can convince people they really want something that they don't want. And that's the challenge with a lot of advertising and other things. That but, was uh, what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah but we're going on, in the, the same direction. on the other hand, um, I'll be the devil's advocate uh, right now. Uh, someone might tell you, uh, Professor Besant, you are advocating plastic. Plastic is toxic. What would you answer to that? Uh, well, in defense of my old friend, the, the brilliant alchemist who invented it, for its time, we didn't know that. <laughs> it's something that's come through. So we have to put the time dimension in here. Uh, but then I'd come back to responsible innovation and say, it's my responsibility um, to come up with an alternative. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the smart company, the smart business says, well, I've built this platform on my plastic. I'm not going to walk away. I'm simply going to say, you value this, but what I'm now going to do is change the ingredients or make it biodegradable mm -hmm. or any one of... So it's driving my innovation towards meeting your concerns. But that implies that it isn't something that I do once. I sell you something and then I run away. I build a relationship with you. And of course, smart businesses are all about relationships. It's about the long term. Uh, and it's being aware of what users want and their changing needs, their changing values. Professor Bassent, I know that this might be a very stupid question, but do you think that humanity in all its dimensions is ready or about to be ready in order to be responsible? Uh, this, I know it might be a stupid question, but are we ready as a species to be responsible? Ah, wow, that's a, that's a very big and very philosophical question. I guess the short answer is um, partially. Mm -hmm. in that we have, um, we've evolved. I think we've learned to use innovation for good. And let me give you a very specific example. Most of my work these days is with the humanitarian sector. People like Save the Children or the Red Cross, we don't have to look far to this devastating tragedy in Turkey yep. to realize how important that is because innovation is going to somehow solve seemingly impossible problems. You know, the roads are smashed, buildings are destroyed, and many of our old recipes won't work. We've got to rethink. So that's a case where innovation matters. And we've learned over time to use innovation to make the world a better place. I, I'd argue we are a much more civilized world than in the mm -hmm. past. 
but we're not perfect. And it's also easy to use ideas for negative things, for deceptive things. I have to say, one of the places you'll find a great deal of innovation is in the criminal world. Oh, criminals, yes. are, criminals are in competition with the forces of law and order, and they're very smart. And if you close this door, they'll find another door. So we have this tendency, we, we're not naturally responsible. We have to keep asking ourselves the questions. The optimist in me thinks we are getting better at it, but uh, uh, it's not perfect. So responsibility must be taught, Professor Besant. I believe so, and it's, a, it's at the heart of our courses. Um, it's at the heart of challenges I'd put when I work with companies, when mm -hmm. I work with other groups. Uh, we, we do have to think, and there are frameworks to help our thinking. There are questions we should ask ourselves, a kind of checklist. Um, for me, perhaps the most important thing is we should never forget the end user and what they want. Um, and that's often easy to do, even if you've got positive motives. Um, some of the research I'm doing at the moment with colleagues in Norway is on healthcare and particularly the aging population. Now, there's a, a solution, we think, which is smart homes. People would love to live in their own homes with dignity and with independence as long as they can. Technology can help this. There's some wonderful devices. The risk is that the technologists say, ah, we know what you need, and here, have a wonderful smart house to live in. That may not be the place somebody wants to live in. The trick is to ask them to get their insights, their, their ideas, their concerns, their anxieties, to put that round the table, and together, the buzzword is co-create that solution. Um, I do have to confess that I feel a little bit frustrated because you are right, you, your activity is a responsible and uh, an important one. But I was thinking at the fact that in order to talk about the dignity of the human being, you have to exist and you have to manifest yourself in a very developed society. In less developed societies, uh, notions like the dignity of elderly people is not quite common phrase, I'm afraid. Yes, but I think some of the lessons we've learned uh, and forgotten here in the advanced West, yep. um, some of those lessons um, about actually taking care of your elderly folk, and indeed those elderly folk taking responsibility to pass on their, their wisdom and experience to raising our youngest children, that kind of integrated uh, village kind of model, um, those lessons go back thousands of years. And I think sometimes we've kind of forgotten them and we could usefully relearn them. Is innovation democratic? And I will try to, um, I will try to put some nuance into this. What do I need in order to be innovative? Uh, innovation can also address to myself. Uh, what do I have to learn in order to be innovative? Well, the really good news is you already are fitted with the most important piece of equipment, your brain. I thought that... And that I, th I thought that... Ah. <laughs> no, 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 okay. no, no. You've got an internal one as well. All right. But, uh, I mean, that, that is the device which has helped us through thousands of years. Um, and indeed, it's at the heart. It's our ability to create, our ability to imagine. And everybody has that. So while we often might think to be an innovator, you need a white coat or a PhD. No, no, they may help with certain kinds of innovation, but the ability to create mm -hmm. is the most important. Having said that, helping you articulate your ideas, helping you shape them, develop them, move them from, as we began, that bing, light bulb idea to something which really creates value, that's a process. And we know a lot about it. And I like to think, since it's my profession, we can pass on the skills to help you do that better. So I, th I believe we can learn to be more innovative, um, but we do start with a, a very big advantage. I was just thinking of the fact that I mentioned the notion obsession uh, a few moments ago. There's also a general psychosis, and it travels along the world and along cultures. This psychosis is something that sounds like you have to reinvent yourself. And this is an imperative. If you don't reinvent yourself, you will disappear. You are no, 
uh, you're not relevant in this contemporary world. And this has become a sort of obsession. Parents obsessed with the creativity of their children, uh, youngsters obsessed with the notion of creativity, but sometimes creativity is understood as overtaking the idea of process, getting very far with very few steps. There's a very large topic, but let us talk a little bit about this obsession of being innovative. How do we solve that? How do we solve the obsession of being creative that creates sometimes little monsters out of this very, very normal, I don't know, power of the human being to be creative? It's a great question. Let, let, let me come at it from two things. One of the things that worries me is that uh, we've got a problem with the innovation word because it's everywhere. You know, take 30 seconds on a company website or listen to TV or adverts, you're going to hit the word. Innovation, driving the business. Innovation. It's an inflation of innovation. Exactly. And the danger is that there's, of course, nothing wrong with innovation, but it's not a slogan. It's not saying we believe in it or it's not a flag we fly. We've got to do something and we need to understand what it is. So then I come to your very powerful question. Um, because I too worry about this obsession, particularly in business, with reinventing. Throw away the past, reinvent. No. Um, one of the interesting questions for me is, let's look at companies, stay with business for a moment, that have been around over a hundred years. I call it the hundred club. Um, and whilst there are, thankfully, quite a few members, uh, there's not as many as you might expect. And if you innovate, uh, sorry, if you survive over a hundred years or more, the chances are you've had to innovate. The world has changed so much in that 100 years, you'd have had to innovate. When you look at them, it's a period of long doing what we do a little better, incrementally improving, but essentially staying with what we've got, punctuated by a few big steps. And very rarely does it involve throwing the whole thing away, but it might involve letting go of something to take a new technology on, or moving in a new direction because the old market has changed. It's essentially what we would call as academics, punctuated equilibrium. So for me, this is really the innovation story. We shouldn't throw away the past. We should in fact build on what we know, build on our knowledge and our capability, but also be open-minded enough to change when we have to. Um, I used to work for a great company um, and people say, oh, they, 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 didn't reinvent themselves. They did, they are doing, it's a hard road and certainly the challenge they hit, this business of uh, moving from a world where what I call wet chemistry in the dark, the whole idea of physical film is replaced by digital images. Um, that's a big change to adapt to. They're doing it, it's just taking a long time, but they haven't thrown away everything. In fact, what they've got to trade on is their knowledge all the lessons they've learned over the hundred years or so since George Eastman first set up the business. And I think there's a lesson there from so many examples. The smart businesses certainly challenge themselves day to day. Are we doing the right things? What should we do more of? What should we do less of or even stop? And what new tricks do we need to learn? So this regular reflection, that's a good thing, mm. but throwing it out, throwing away the past, reinventing every day, I'm not a fan, I, and I, I worry like you about this obsession. How do you react in um, normal professional circumstances when you are yourself and you, it's obvious that you are a part of, of a classical school that puts value in what we call process, development through a process. How do you react when you meet people who are in a hurry and who will ask you for magic formulas or for shortcuts in order to overtake all elements concerning a process and getting to a result as fast as possible? What do you do? Well, it's, it's a clash. Um, uh, there is no fast, easy solution. It is something we have to learn. Um, I think we can, as teachers, as, as, as coaches, we can help speed up that learning process. I've had to transform my own practice from a world where 
people were patient enough to listen to me and I'd talk for an hour. Oh, yes. That's not possible anymore. Uh, as my kids reminded me, Dad, nobody reads books anymore. They watch YouTube or other things on the TV. So I've had to rethink what I do. And I've had to rethink the ways I might deliver what I do. But I think the fundamental underlying lessons, there is no shortcut. We need that process. We can either trip over ourselves and learn the hard way, or we can learn um, uh, grudgingly, perhaps, that we do need some kind of a process. Um, but from our side, we can streamline the process and we can certainly change the way we communicate it. Um, and I guess that's what I've spent the last 10 years of my uh, university career trying to do is uh, trying to communicate in different ways with my students and increasingly with business, trying to, uh, to get the message across in what I call a sideways fashion. That's partly why some of this stuff behind me is important. Uh, I found music is quite a good way to... Uh, 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 to get their attention and they weren't expecting it and uh, sometimes I can infuse them enough to then read a little bit of a book or dig a little more deeply into the process. What kind of music is the music that you vibrate to? Uh, what I like to listen to? Yes. What I, um, I think um, I'd like to think it's a very eclectic mm -hmm. mixture. The thing you could really do to punish me is to deprive me of music. But what you give me, um, I don't mind too much. Um, and I'm trying still to keep an open mind with emerging music. But I love classics. I love jazz. Um, I've been playing all my life. Um, and so I play a variety of different things. Um, I think music for me is, 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 is really important. And it does, uh, I think, speak a slightly different language. I think some of the neuropsychology now is suggesting it's affecting different bits of our brain. Um, as I say, as a teacher, I've used this uh, partly to, uh, to plant an earworm or to, to get at people uh, or my students to think in a slightly different way um, uh, about what I've been trying to tell them. With your kind permission, I will give you a very trivial example and ask a trivial question as well. So think of a pair of shoes. Um, the real thing that this pair of shoes is B quality. Um, and you come from your position as a guru in marketing, in innovation. And the guy who made the shoes will ask you, what do I have to do to make more money and to be more relevant on the market? And maybe you will tell him, you could tell him, you should reconsider your positioning. You should reposition your product uh, you should present it as luxury, not even premium, but luxury. Raise the price and I'll guarantee you that you'll be happy. Uh, do you do that? Uh, no. no I, I, it, 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 it's a great example, really good. And, and um, I think I'd start off by saying, look, there is an opportunity. Despite the fact that we've had shoes for probably 10,000 years, um, there's still an opportunity. Um, if there's 8 billion people in the world, that's 16 billion shoes you might make. So that's a market. You would like a piece of that. And if you already got a business, maybe you'd like a bigger piece. The most important thing is position, as you've said. You know, be strategic. Where are you going to play? If you sell the cheapest shoe, then you're probably competing with a lot of other people. That's hard to do unless you can be really cheap. Um, that luxury thing, well, that's a very tricky place to go to. Um, one or two people, I won't mention any names, but one or two of the famous shoemakers can sell a pair of shoes for thousands of euros. Yes. Uh, so um, start with the strategy. And the first part of the strategy is what I said earlier on. Understand your user. Now, be clear which user you're interested in, uh, but look at how they use shoes. What shoes mean in their lives? Uh, is it something just to keep your feet dry in the rain and to walk? Is it something that's a fashion statement that gives you a social identity? Is it something that makes you feel good? There are many different things that shoes do for us. Um, I need to understand, or you as the manufacturer, yep. we need to understand that user and then work with that. So it's back to this value proposition idea. And of course, the reason there are so many brands of shoes and the market is so segmented is because there's plenty of space to play. So the one thing I wouldn't do is say, I'm going for this one, 
because that's where the money's to be made. No, no, I'd start being strategic. Um, and then I have to put around that core idea, if I'm going to address that luxury market of somebody who really values this because it's a very personalized product, very unique and so on, then how am I going to do that? How am I going to make it to the highest quality? Where am I going to get that wonderful raw material? Maybe these days, maybe I've got to think in vegan terms. Perhaps it shouldn't be leather anymore, whatever. But I've really got to think, how do I assemble the other things around my idea to make it really create value? And that's perhaps another piece of the innovation story. You can't do it on your own. This idea of the solo act, forget it. It's a multiplayer game. And you've got to get the who else and the what else around you. You've got to build a, a, a value network. Do you ever get the sensation that the world is slipping out of your hands as long as even the notion of discourse is obsolete? And lots of people do listen to any type of discourse as a sort of necessity, as a sort of hearing something almost liturgic. And you don't have to understand that. You have to, I don't know, you have to be through that. I've been through that. I've been listening to that. Uh, it's enough. Understanding is very far. It's no need to understand. Um, I've been through this liturgic uh, experience and that's enough. How, how do you do to be yourself and to convey the meaning that you want to convey? Wow, that's a, another very big question. I, I think for me, yes, I, I worry sometimes. As a, I'm an optimist, but I do worry that we are losing a facility for critical thinking, for making up our own mind. Um, and that is, I think, hugely, technology must take a lot of responsibility. We can access so much at the touch of a fingertip. Uh, we can um, call out. We don't even need to use our fingers. We can just ask our virtual assistant, give me this, give me that. Um, the worry is we lose the ability to discern, the ability to, to think critically, to make up our own minds based on evidence, not emotion. Um, and that's, uh, if you look at a little bit further, and I do think it's on the very near horizon, what artificial intelligence is now beginning to be able to do, mm -hmm. this idea of generative artificial intelligence. We've got to have that critical ability to know when the answers they bring us are wrong. Um, these models are very powerful, but they hallucinate, they make things up. They're... And if we don't know how to judge that, if we simply adopt their liturgy, we're in deep trouble. So for me, whether it's students or people I meet in, the, in my pub or elsewhere, I worry when we don't have the critical thinking. And I think the rise of, of populism in so many countries is a, a symptom of that. So yes, uh, uh, I'm not sure I have an answer to it except to keep pushing uh, the, the values I hold around making up your own mind, being a critical thinker, and using the tools of, 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 of critical thinking. I was watching yesterday uh, one of your courses, um, and at a certain moment, you said in very mild terms and in very elegant formulas, you said, if you have to, you might be innovative even when you are copying your competitors. This might be um, an appropriate attitude in some circumstances, you said. If you think of one of the great thinkers of last year's, uh, which is called Jean Baudrillard, and he was talking about this alienated contemporary world, which is a copy of a copy, he said, a copy without an original. How will you comment that? Wow, yeah. it's, a, it's a great question. I, I think the context in which I would have been talking in suggesting copying is an appropriate uh, approach to innovation, um, it's copy and develop. There's absolutely nothing wrong with learning from someone who's done something well. Absolutely. I'm I'm trying to teach myself to draw. You don't want to see my terrible results, but nonetheless, I'm getting better day by day copying. 
And that's a classic way of teaching art students, and it's a classic way of uh, teaching surgeons or any other. So copying has a value. But the real innovation answer is copy and develop. Copy, internalize, take it forward. So for me, that copying, that, that replication, if you like, is possibly what, what's led us to be successful as innovators in history, that we have taken those templates and built upon them. There's also lots of data in the world, around the world. There's an absolutely enormous amount of data and it has become almost impossible to comprehend. And the general image of mankind might be one in which the whole earth is slowly drowning in a notion of data. And an important part of this ocean of data is wrong data, false data. How do we as a species learn to swim in this ocean, Professor Bessant? <laughs> oh, um, yes, you're right, of course. But in a sense, from the very beginnings, when we were evolving, we were facing with this challenge. How do we take in a, a booming, blooming, buzzing confusion, as one great psychologist called it? There's just so many stimuli. And there's a very famous, uh, widely reproduced experiment which um, basically shows we can't pay attention to everything that we have selective attention as a species. We've learned to focus on certain things that might attack us, might threaten us, but that means not paying attention to other stuff. You may have seen, it's a wonderful thing, um, a, a film of some students playing a game of basketball and they're bouncing the ball and having good fun. Um, and uh, they're so busy um, playing the game. And then suddenly in the middle, a gorilla walks across the stage. It's not a real one, it's someone dressed up. Um, beats their chest and waves their hands and very slowly saunters off. You can show this to people and if you set them up beforehand and say, focus on the basketball and count how many times do they bounce and pass the ball, they're so busy focusing, they don't see the gorilla. It's what psychologists call inattentional blindness. Um, and it really reflects our, our cognitive makeup. We have to pay attention to the things that matter and we trade off the other things. So we've kind of evolved as a species to manage our attention spans, at least to get us through and stay alive and survive. If I then flip to what you've talked about, the sea of data, which is expanding by the, by, by the second, um, we need to convert that to useful information and we need to extract knowledge from it. So we need to work with it. And it brings me back to some of the tools that I think we have available to us. Um, for me, artificial intelligence can play a very important role in that sifting of data to find things which appear to be relevant so they can present information organized out of that sea of data. We still have to judge. We still have to use our accumulated experience and knowledge, our wisdom to challenge that, to test it, to make sure it's right. So in a sense, we need to um, be teaching and sharing and developing those skills of um, uh, uh, analyzing, looking for relevant, provable evidence, the scientific method, if we go right back to the Renaissance and so on, this is where those sorts of ideas really began to take shape. And I think those are the skills we need more than ever. I think though it's very difficult to do in a world where information is coming at, or data is coming at us from all angles in such a rich way. Um, and I worry about the um, the statistics that suggest that attention spans are shrinking. Um, I go back to what I said, you know, I could rely on students at least halfway staying awake in a 45-minute lecture from me. Now we're talking about attention spans measured in TikTok world, which is you know, very, very short videos, very short things. This is a, this is a concern. Um, I think we have to push back against it as far as we can in our education systems to train the yep. critical analytic thinking. Professor Bestin, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. It's been a privilege to talk to you. And um, um, I'm pretty sure that your students are lucky to have you as a professor. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been fascinating and, and challenging. You, you, you've got me thinking as well, which is always a good conversation.
Thank you so much and good luck with everything that you do. Thank you. Tuturor celor care sunt alături de Garantat 100%, mulțumim frumos pentru încredere. Ne vedem duminica viitoare. Rămâneți alături de programele postului public. Să aveți o seară frumoasă!